Hello everyone and welcome to a new pre-searing video. I think that if you get invested enough into a game, you'll start thinking about it even when you're not actively playing it. Whether it's reading up on lore, theorizing a new crazy build or, in the case of this video, thinking about what cool new features could be added into the game if it was still in active development. That was me not too long ago and I started thinking. What if Guild Wars Utopia was released, the now cancelled fourth campaign, featuring the chronomancer profession, magicians skilled with manipulating time. If that was the case, I think it would have a great potential for a chronomancer NPC that lets your post-searing character travel back in time to pre-searing, creating a new hidden save file that would be accessed every time you time travel with that character, allowing everyone to earn the legendary Defender of Ascalon title, and of course, after time traveling with your character, your character's new profile would be set to level 1 and all the items deleted until you time travel back, allowing back and forth switching between your post-searing and pre-searing profiles without any harm to pre-economy. I think that would be a great way to let everyone enjoy this fantastic area at their own pace, without really having to rush to 20 to move on to post or having to create a character in prophecies only for this title. And that creates one interesting question though. How would the remaining professions work in pre-searing? Now, if you didn't like my time travel idea, that's fine. Hell, even I am not fully convinced that it would be good for the longevity of pre-searing. I love the area as it is now, and a fair bit of changes would have to happen to accommodate for the four new professions. For the sake of this video, let's assume that together with this change the collectors would be updated to trade the appropriate armor, and the monsters in the area would drop daggers, spears, scythes, and ritualists' staves. And also, as a side piece of trivia, it's actually already possible to get a ritualist staff in pre-searing. If you go and open a hidden stash, you can get a dead staff and they can roll all possible caster modifiers, including channeling magic, Restoration magic, communing, and spawning power. Alright, back to the video. I think we can also safely assume that the classes will get a Vanguard Initiate Armor bonus depending on their max armor value in post, seeing as the six core professions seem to follow this rule. And that would mean that Ritualists get 35 armor at level 20 just like all the other casters, Dervishes and Assassins get 55 similarly to Rangers, and Paragons will join Warriors in having a whooping 70 armor modifier. If you'd like to know specifics on how the Vanguard Initiate buff works, I recommend watching my other video on that, shameless self-promotion, but with the way it works, I'm pretty convinced the armor bonus from Mysticism should also stack with it. And that leaves us with probably the most interesting thing to discuss, available skills. Much of the flavor of Preceding is created by the extremely limited skill pool, after comprising of downright garbage abilities. I'm looking at you, Power Shot. Every profession has access to the Resurrection Signet and between 6 and 8 additional skills, among which there is always at least one dedicated to healing. It just so happens that the intro quest of Factions and Nightfall also equip fresh heroes with a set of abilities like that, and while you can clearly see that the Guild Wars devs had much greater understanding of what constitutes as a strong early skill bar than when releasing prophecies, the skills still generally fit the preceding criteria pretty well, so I think they are perfect for a little thought experiment. As a little side note, I decided that for the sake of simplicity, and for the purpose of this video, the four new professions will only have access to the core 6 as their secondaries, the preceding area was designed specifically with the core 6 professions in mind, with each area corresponding to one of them, and I think adding new secondary profession quests and a bunch of new NPCs wouldn't really fit. But if you think otherwise, then please let me know, and uh, feel free to discuss potential new profession combinations in the comments, because I would really love to see some cool new builds you might come up with. So, with that out of the way, let's take a deep dive and start with everyone's favorite stabby boy, the Assassin. Right off the bat, I'll tell you that with Critical Strikes as their primary attribute and with the 7 skills they get in Shing J tutorial, they come off as the strongest out of the 4 new professions. The Assassin utilizes the combo chain mechanic, starting with a lead attack into an offhand attack and finishing with a dual attack. The role of these skills here is filled by Unsuspecting Strike, Fox Fangs and Twisting Fangs respectively. 
All of these skills deal pretty good damage with unsuspecting strike hitting for a crazy amount for perceiving standards and twisting thanks also applying bleed and deep wound just in case the enemy wasn't dead yet. To support this combo assassins get access to shadow refuge which serves as their healing skills. It grants health regeneration similar to troll unguent but for half the duration instead healing for about 80 at the end. On top of that, assassins can cast Death's Charge, which will heal them if the enemy has more health than them, and while this probably won't happen often, the real benefit of this skill is the Shadow Step. Movement skills are practically non-existent in Preceiving and having access to teleport to an enemy sounds really, really strong, even on a hefty 30 second cooldown. And if two healing skills weren't enough, the assassins can also use Shroud of Distress as an oh shit button, granting them a high health regeneration and a crazy 75% chance to block all attacks if their HP draws below half. The last skill is Dancing Daggers, which throws three daggers for a mediocre damage on a half range and can be used instead of Unsuspecting Strike as a lead attack. This can be compared to Point Blank Shot and is generally pretty meh, especially compared to their otherwise fantastic kit. Summing all that up, assassins seem very strong for pre-standards and a very powerful character even without a secondary profession, but I went ahead anyway and theory crafted a potential fun assassin slash warrior build utilizing Frenzy to not only upkeep 33% increased attack speed, but also as a trigger for Shroud of Distress. The only downside of this strategy is the fact that Shroud is an enchantment, so there is a pretty high chance it will get shattered by Char Chaos, but it should work perfectly in high-level vanguard quests. The second faction's profession, the Ritualist, seems much weaker in comparison, but I think it would really shine if you were to level in a duo with a friend. In the Xing Jie Monastery they get access to 8 skills, the first one being Pain, which creates a spirit that attacks your enemies, and the damage dealt by the ghost ignores all armor so it might come in handy versus high level vanguard enemies, but otherwise it seems pretty basic. It can be further upgraded by hexing the enemy with painful bond which causes the enemy attacked by your spirits as well as every enemy that's adjacent to them to take extra damage, And but this combined with its hefty energy cost of 15 also makes it sound pretty weak unlike the second spirit the ritualist can summon, Union. This ghost negates up to 15 damage every time a non-spirit in your party takes damage, so instead it redirects it to itself. This is a fantastic skill for pre-searing as most of the damage is taken in a lot of small hits as opposed to pretty big spikes, uh, meaning that the Union Spirit will essentially tank the majority of the damage for you. This works similarly to Shielding Hands, but has potential to protect you for far longer than 8 seconds. Ritualists also gain access to one directly the magic skill, Spirit Rift. After 3 seconds the target and all enemies adjacent are dealt pretty heavy damage and suffer from cracked armor. And here I have to come clean, I actually have no clue how cracked armor would work in Preceding, the description says that it re won't reduce the enemy's armor under 60 and I imagine no enemy in Preceding actually has 60 armor to begin with, so it might actually do nothing. If you know how the condition works on low armor enemies, please let me know in the comments. The rest of Ritualist skills focus on enhancing or creating weapons and are the reason why, in my opinion, the profession would really shine in duo hunting. Brutal Weapon increases the target's damage by about 10, provided that they are not enchanted, and Vengeful Weapon acts as a sort of a shield, causing the user to lifesteal about 40 damage after being hit. It's exactly like enchanting someone to cast Vampiric Gaze once being, uh, upon being damaged. The last weapon enchantment is Weapon of Warding, and it gives the wielder decent health regen and 50% chance to block attacks for 8 seconds, like a sort of weaker version of the Shroud of Distress, but with a much shorter cooldown. The last skill for Ritualists is Generous Wastsun Grai, which creates an urn of ashes, which when held increases your max health and heals you for a big amount when you drop it. This would be a pretty good spell if not for the 10% health cost together with its energy cost and the inability to attack while under its effects. 
All in all, I think the Ritualist could be really fun with a Necromancer secondary to fulfill the Minion Master role of Pre-Searing, and with a bunch of Bone Horrors and the Union Spirit you could easily sustain yourself without investing many points into Blood Magic. Here are the builds I came up with. Moving on from Kantha to Elona, we have the Paragon, who is my personal favorite profession, and I'm happy to announce that they seem pretty balanced in their Preceding version, as both the six skills they get aren't broken and their primary attribute leadership doesn't synergize really well with the cap of two party size of the area. They do, however, get access to a very cool skill in Anthem of Flame, which causes the next attack skill used by party members to cause burning. With leadership of 12 or 10 plus 2 from the helmet, the burning time reaches 3 seconds of minus 7 health degradation and it also synergizes well with their next skill being Mending Refrain. That provides a low level of health regeneration and can be upkept infinitely if you use Anthem of Flame on cooldown. Paragons also get access to two signets, Signet of Synergy, which sadly cannot be used solo unless you have a pet, and Signet of Aggression that gives you 2 Adrenaline when under the effects of Until of Flame. The last two skills are Spear Attacks and they aren't very good. Barbed Spear inflicts bleeding and it can be directly compared to Sever Artery which costs 2 Adrenaline more but it keeps the bleeding for longer and Wild Throw which removes a stance and deals a little bit of additional damage for the hefty cost of 7 Adrenaline this is pretty much strictly a weaker version of Executioner's Strike, dealing about half of its damage, and on top of that the only stance used by enemies in Pre-Searing is Frenzy, and you usually want them to have it on for the double damage, so removing it is a further downside. Just like Ritualists, I think Pre-Searing Paragons would shine most when in group with another player, and due to their spear attacks being pretty bad, I propose these two builds, either a melee paragon slash warrior combination or a bow based paragon slash ranger. And the last profession to discuss is the dervish, often regarded as one of the strongest in the entire game, it sounds very busted in its preceding version at first glance and reveals its downsides further down the road. So let's discuss the elephant in the room first, the Scythe. The Scythe's inherent ability to strike up to three targets with basic attacks already pushes Dervish high up in the efficiency department, as area of effect damage in Preceding are extremely valuable. Now if we take a look at the skills available to the Dervishes in the Nightfall tutorial, you'll see that they are actually an AoE powerhouse. First up, there's Heart of the Holy Flame. This mysticism skill first deals damage all around the dervish, causing your attacks to deal holy damage, and when it ends after 30 seconds or when shattered, it causes all adjacent foes to burn for several seconds. Next up, there's Grant's Fingers, which works similarly, also dealing a lot of damage up front, but then it changes your attack style to cold damage and at the end it transfers conditions from you to adjacent enemies. Sadly, or well actually not sadly, there aren't many conditions in Pre-Searing, the only two the player can be subjected to are Bleeding and Deep Wound caused by Vanguard Skeletons, Bandits and Blazefiend Griefblade, but even without any of those, there's another ability that deals AoE damage up front. And there is of course AoE skill number 3, Whirling Charge. This would probably be the single best skill in Pre-Searing, increasing your movement speed by 33% for 4 seconds at attribute 8 and 5 seconds at attribute 11 and, you guessed it, causing a bunch of AoE damage to all enemies adjacent to your target the first time you attack. When you're established pre-player with a lot of wealth, you can generally eat a cupcake every time you want to spend a lot of time in a single area, like doing long vanguard quests or even splurging for fast char runs and upkeep a 50% movement speed increase for 10 minutes, but Whirling Charge would be free to use, so you could basically zoom through every area consistently, and it also comes with the area damage component. 
Dervishes also have access to Chilling Victory, a scythe attack that deals additional damage and even more damage on top of it if the enemy you're targeting has less health than you for 6 Adrenaline. This is like a cheaper, small AoE version of Executioner's Strike and it will deal its full damage 99% of the time since in Preceding you'll rarely have less health than your enemy. This is however where the fantastic sides of the Preceding Dervish would end. The next skill on the list is Imbue Health, which heals for a really good amount but cannot be used on yourself, meaning that in most circumstances in Preceding it would be extremely useless. And the last skill is Crippling Sweep, causing cripple and dealing a bit of additional damage if the foe is moving. Generally the enemies you'll face in Preceding will stand still, so both cripple and the additional damage won't really apply, meaning this skill is also pretty useless. On top of that, the dervishes have no self-healing skills in their kits at all, and because of that I think a monk secondary would complement them perfectly, not only giving them plenty of healing, but also letting them upkeep healing breeze for longer than other professions, since they cast so many enchantments on themselves and are pretty safe from all the shatters. Here's an example build I came up with. If you're however not interested in playing it safe and you're instead interested in pushing the clear speed to the maximum, I also thought of this wonky dervish slash elementalist build where the whole purpose would be to run straight into the Char Altar and see if you can AoE all of them down before they send you back to the shrine. Here it is. And with that we arrived at the end of the video. I would like to sincerely thank you all for watching. I don't make this type of videos often and I would really like to. I actually have a note on my phone with 10 additional video ideas like this. So if you enjoyed or have any feedback, please, please let me know in the comments. And have a great day and I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.